Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being so prompt. It's my pleasure uh, as president of the World Monuments Fund to welcome you to our spring 2015 lecture. And in a new venue, one that I think we all find interesting and exciting to see another auditorium if you're not familiar with this place. Uh, I noticed that the slogan of Rockefeller University is science for the benefit of humanity. And we might just change the words around a little to say that the benefit of science for humanity is a kind of sub-theme of World Monuments Fund since we apply many of the new technologies that uh, people are learning uh, to save the great treasures of the past. And you'll hear a little bit about that in the course of this evening and see some very innovative uh, graphics. WMF is now well uh, into the celebration of its 50th anniversary. There will be more events of this nature uh, coming up in the course of the year and culminating in our gala event next fall on the 21st of October where we'll celebrate 50 years and the accomplishment of two extraordinary ladies who will be our honorees this year. Look for your save the date card in the mail. You'll be receiving it soon, and I'm not going to reveal who it will be, but I do want to encourage you to join us. And I'd like to start by thanking our anniversary sponsors, Tiffany and & Company and American Express, which have made uh, big investments in helping us to celebrate this event, to capture uh, the history of the organization and to communicate it to our constituencies to our constituents around the country and around the world, including all of you. Thank you for supporting us, and do come and be part of our events. Uh, the first thing I will do tonight is to welcome one of those sponsors, Richard Brown, the Vice President of Philanthropy for American Express, uh, to say a few words on this occasion. Thank you very much. Come on up, Richard. It is a real delight to be here uh, this evening. Uh, I have the pleasure to work at American Express, uh, a company that I have been working for for the last seven years, and I work in the areas of leadership development and historic preservation. Uh, I think that we are just delighted to be a sponsor of the 50th anniversary. Uh, it's something that we're very proud of. It's something that our whole executive team is uh, very proud of. We have a long history of working with the World Monuments Fund. It goes back to 1996 when we first sponsored the watch. And so it's delightful that we are here once more to celebrate the 50th anniversary. I also want to make sure that I um, uh, give our thanks and our, our, our real our pleasure to have worked with Bonnie over the years. Uh, she's been a true leader of this organization and one that we've had a phenomenal relationship with. So without further ado, I'd like to bring uh, the further Bonnie back up and uh, we'll get on with the program. Amongst other things, the World Monuments Watch celebrates its 20th anniversary this year, and when we launched the 2016 watch list in the fall, we will not only reveal a whole new range of sites uh, that are waiting to be discovered by the world community and in need of assistance, but reviewing many of the ones that have been on the watch in the past, uh, retrospectively looking at how successful this program has been. And it certainly wouldn't have been possible without the help of American Express and without that imprimatur uh, that helped us attract people from around the world to nominate their sites uh, to this survey of sites in need of, of assistance. Another major feature of the anniversary will be a book, uh, and which will really be the centerpiece of telling our story uh, over, of the last 50 years of our engagement in this field. Rather than simply talking about 50 sites, site after site, we decided to invite a group of authors to write about the places where we work, to gain the perspectives of people who love these places and care about them, and to uh, enjoy hearing from the viewpoint of a writer uh, what's important about the places in relation to the challenges that they face. Uh, we selected a group of eight sites and eight writers to help us portray these places from Venice to Rome, Cairo, the highlands of Peru, 
Mexico City, China, and others. And Andrew Solomon was the linchpin in helping us put together this group of intellectuals and helping us to conceive and execute this project, which has just been shipped to the printer this week, much to the relief of many of us who've been working on it for the last several months. Uh, Andrew's been a member of the board of the World Monuments Fund since the middle 90s. And he's been a, a, an absolutely wonderful voice uh, and perspective within our inner circle, uh, seeing the world from his perspective, traveling to the distant places all around the world in order to experience their essence and writing about them in uh, a number of uh, prominent magazines and outlets. And so the book, uh, the, the 50th anniversary book, will be in some ways also uh, the culmination of our relationship with Andrew Solomon. You will receive a copy of it when you attend our 50th anniversary gala. And if you're fortunate, you might be able to uh, get one of the authors involved in the book to inscribe it for you. So do plan to put away October 21st, and we'll all see you there. Uh, for tonight, Andrew will be talking about his book topic, The Chenlung Garden, which we see through the lens of discovery of, of heretofore very little known or unknown places that have come to light in part through our efforts. Andrew is a very celebrated writer, as I'm sure you all know, a lecturer on politics, culture, and psychology. He's the current president of Penn America and he is a uh, PhD in lecturer on clinical psychology at Columbia University. He's been a contributor to many magazines and other fora, uh, literary fora, and his two uh, nonfiction books, Far From the Tree, Parents, Children, and the Search for Identity, and The Noonday Demon, An Atlas of Depression, have both received National Book Awards and many, many other literary awards. But we know him largely through his travels and through uh, his experiences around the world. He's been a very caring world citizen who always calls for a briefing and dives deep into the environments that he visits. So it's going to be a great pleasure to hear Andrew tonight talking about the Chenlin Garden in the Forbidden City in Beijing. Please join me in welcoming. <laughs> Well, I'm going to begin by reiterating what Bonnie has just said, which is that I am a writer and an enthusiast rather than an enormous expert on the architecture of the Forbidden City. Um, and I also just thought I would comment that Outward Opulence for Inner Peace is not, in fact, the name of a book about the board of the World Monuments Fund, um, <laughs> but rather a commentary on the Chenlung Emperor. Um, so with that, uh, I will begin. Uh, the central axis of the Forbidden City, there it is, um, it was designed to impress and intimidate. The Juenqin Jai, um, or Studio of Exhaustion from Diligent Service, which is the area that the World Monuments Fund has been working on, was built by the Qianlong Emperor for his retirement. Um, and it is intended to coddle and caress. Clandestine, Though it may have been to the masses, the Forbidden City was public to its privileged visitors, an architectural rendition of the Emperor's immutable being. The Zhuanqin Jai offers an almost lonely privacy. Most great monuments are for civic consumption, but the Qianlong Emperor built the Zhuanqin Jai complex and the surrounding garden for himself, envisioning a lodge that would allow him to live according to his habits, but free from his responsibilities, which sounds like a rather attractive arrangement. <laughs> Though there is nothing modest about the Zhuanqin Jai, um, a refined discretion nuances its opulence. If the Forbidden City is a grand sculpture, this is a jeweled object. As a linchpin among heaven, man, and earth, the emperor enacted a formal immutable self. But the Zhuanqin Jai acknowledges the passage of time. For all its sumptuousness, 
It humanizes anyone who enters it, and I think we'll see how. Now, I will give you a little bit of background on my own uh, position and how I came to be interested in this project in the first place. I first went to China in 1982 when I was a student with my parents. And at that time, the streets of Beijing still consisted mainly of hutongs. As many of you in the room know, most of those hutongs have been destroyed, which is, um, I think, a, a terrible loss. Down those narrow alleys, um, anxious people in Mao suits bicycled at lackadaisical speed. There are some of them, keeping a deliberate distance from foreigners. The city was dusty and decaying. Luxury, that corrupting anti-communist idea, was essentially non-existent for the Chinese and, I might add, for the tourists as well. In the 1950s, inspired by Moscow's Red Square, Authorities had cleared Tiananmen of the uh, Qing-walled north-south imperial corridor flanked by government buildings, creating the expanse of Tiananmen as we now know it. The square turned barren, brutally austere, and insufferably grandiose, a place where the pomp of the communist state could be paraded before an awestruck population. In the middle of this dilapidation of Beijing as it then was, incongruously rose the forbidden city, long revered as the ultimate stronghold of power where the most prosperous rulers in the world had once held their hidden court. Now, of course, Buckingham Palace is rather grander than the street, the houses across from it, and the Louvre puts the Rue de Rivoli to shame, but I have never, before or since, encountered so immediate and stark a contrast as that between the Forbidden City and Deng Xiaoping's Beijing. They seem to have been produced by different races and to reflect mentalities 10,000 miles apart. When our astutely political chaperone showed us through the Forbidden City, he attempted to condescend to the values it embodied, but he couldn't entirely eliminate the wonder in his voice as he described the life that had once unfolded there. In the outer court, we felt the aloofness of the imperial rulers of China. Nothing about these buildings was designed to offer comfort. In the inner court, we saw the emperor's apartments. There they are. But even these proved to be forbidding manifestations of imperial station. The splendid halls reflected the inherited wealth and exploitative prerogatives of aristocracy that the country had officially rejected. But it was hard, even for our conscientiously communist guide, not to be awed by the bravado of the enterprise. The Forbidden City was built in just 14 years through the efforts of the million workers and is the largest unified complex of wooden buildings in the world. The wood itself is rare and precious, and every yellow roof tile, that being the imperial color, glorifies the emperor. The Forbidden City was the seat of government for 600 years, for 24 emperors in two dynasties, the Ming and the Qing. In 1982, our minder was more comfortable with the militarism of the Great Wall than with these palatial quarters, but he recognized that the building's conceptual grace and exquisite proportions represented the apogee of something brilliantly Chinese, that they constituted part of his cultural heritage. And I think that's part of why so much of the Forbidden City was able to survive so intact to a very troubled time in China's history. At that time, we neither saw nor heard of the Qianlong Emperor's garden complex, uh, the landscape at the far end of which the Zhuanqin Jai stands. The site was too intimate for the burgeoning crowds of tourists, and no one in China then had the skills requisite for its conservation. Its decades of neglect also, however, suggest an element of purposeful disregard. It would have been problematic to feel or express respect for a complex of such ostentatious refinement. Although the communists accused the Qing dynasty of exploitation, those emperors had represented total authority. 
a legacy that Mao and his successors gamely claimed. The pavilions of the retirement garden, on the other hand, um, represent lavish materialism and rarefied intellect, and thus were utterly anathema to Maoism. The Forbidden City was still at the heart of the Chinese command, and the sizable portrait of Mao, who of course died in 1976, that still hangs over its entrance gate, was a potent sign of his enduring authority. And one thinks of how the removal of the collection of paintings, which were the imperial paintings, to Taiwan formed one of the central bases for the Taiwanese government's uh, claims in that period to be the valid government of China. These monuments carried enormous significance. In contrast to Mao at the Gate, the retirement garden was a luxurious place of repose for an emperor to pamper himself with solitude after giving up power. And the latter-day rulers of China were not interested in life after power. Nor were champions of collective action interested in the meditative sequestration of an individual. I returned to the Forbidden City on numerous occasions in the course of my travels, but I didn't even learn of the existence of the retirement gardens until 1999. The buildings there, including the Nine Bay Zhuangzhenjai, had been ignored so utterly as to suffer little looting or destruction. The Qianlong Emperor had issued a decree commanding that the garden be maintained per permanently as a retreat for retired emperors. But since no emperors retired, it became the beneficiary of benign neglect for most of the remaining years of the Qing dynasty, then was locked up in 1924 and used only as storage space by the Palace Museum staff who were focused on the public areas of the Forbidden City. When it was unlocked in 1999, as the Palace Museum began to prepare for the Olympic bid and to welcome collaboration from abroad, it was a time capsule, one of the few survivors of the attack on history that was China's 20th century. It was weathered, faded, and rather decayed, but it retained its integrity, and conserving it would require little of the guesswork that has plagued interventions at other historic Chinese sites. Now, let me say a bit about the Qianlong Emperor himself, the one who produced it. There he is in a sort of standard formal uh, imperial portrait. He was the sixth emperor of the Manchu Qing dynasty, and he ruled officially from 1735 to 1796, though he effectively reigned until 1799. Noted for his brilliance as a child, he was anointed over his um, wastrel brothers for his sobriety of demeanor, his learning in literature and philosophy. There he is contemplating his own art collection and the beautiful objects with which he had surrounded himself, and his easy genius in human relations. He was a man of towering ambition, China's equivalent to Louis XIV, Catherine the Great, or Emperor Franz Joseph. He expanded China's borders. There he is, painted um, by the court painter Giuseppe Castiglione, um, and shown in very, very splendid imperial armor that he, in fact, never wore into battle. Um, uh, and he, uh, uh, he expanded China's borders and became the wealthiest man at the in the world. At the height of his rule, China held a positive balance of trade um, with all Western nations. He was the author of more than 40,000 poems, an impeccable connoisseur with wit, elegance, and artistic talent on his side. And here's an example of his um, really very brilliant and very well-studied calligraphy. He also, of course, oversaw the burning of books and the torture and execution of writers whose work displeased him. Chan Lung styled himself in later life as the old man of the ten perfect victories, modesty not being one of his defining characteristics. And indeed, he had consolidated Qing rule and increased the size of China by a third. At his death, his country's population had grown over 20%, and on his deathbed, he apologized to his son for leaving two rebellions still unquashed. 
Qianlong was the grandson of the Kangxi Emperor, the longest serving ruler in Chinese history. And as a matter of respect, Qianlong was determined not to overshadow his grandfather's reign. And it should be noted that it was really his grandfather who had anointed him to be um, the emperor um, uh, over any of his siblings and had really thrown himself behind, um, uh, behind Chen Lung's sort of glorification, um, his transformation into what he was uh, before he ascended to, the, uh, uh, to be the emperor when he was called the precious prince. Um, uh, so Chen Long, not wishing to overshadow his grandfather, talked about the idea of retirement, the first emperor ever to contemplate such a step. For a meaningful disengagement from the machinery of state, he wanted a garden which he envisioned as a marvelous landscape of sculpted rocks and pavilions. And there's a sort of first look, a kind of semi-aerial look across um, at part of what he built. He undertook the project when he was in his early 60s though he would not consider retirement until he reached 85, one year short of his grandfather's dominion. The design and construction of his own quarters there, the Zhuan Jinjai, occupied the emperor from 1771 to 1774. Its decoration took another two years, which may make any of you feel better about construction projects you are involved with at the moment. During this period, he handed off most matters of state and allowed corruption to infiltrate his court. Um, and he paid particular attention to his son-in-law, whom he adored and whom no one else seems to have adored, Ha Shen, um, who was forced to commit suicide uh, after Chen Lung's death because he had accumulated so much illicit wealth. Chen Lung's 60-year rule, this is Ha Shen, of course, Chen Lung's 60 year rule was the most stable in the world, which allowed for great wealth, but it also created a cultural stagnation in which China was largely bypassed by modernity and by the first stirrings of the Industrial Revolution. In the period following his rule, foreigners came into China and overspending on wars and the putting down of rebellions impoverished the court. The John Qinjai project manifest Chen Long's blend of finesse, brilliance, and decadent laxity. He built this precious sanctuary as an artistic diversion, and he never spent a night in it. Though he entered his so-called retirement in 1795, he effectively reigned until his death in 1799, refusing to move out of the emperor's quarters or relinquish any aspect of authority. And I was very taken with the fact that in official documents from that period following his ostensible retirement, um, official documents showed the beginning of his son's reign. But in court documents, everything refers to it as the later years of his reign. They're all dated as the um, uh, late years of, uh, of his dominion. The retirement, gar the retirement garden reproduces the basic imperial processional structure its main buildings evoke the primary edifices of the larger complex, with similar public courtyards preceding private ones. Its almost two acres were meant to encapsulate the overall structure of the 180-acre Forbidden City. It was also intended as an outsized version of a scholar's garden, adapting subtle landscape principles from the southern gardens of Suzhou, Yangzhou, and Hangzhou for grand purposes. And there's an image from uh, Suzhou, and there is a, a painting of a garden from that previous period. It would not be a classic scholar's rockery, nor a locus of imperial magnificence. It would blend the contemplative poetry of one with the stately ambition of the other. For Europeans, and indeed I think largely for Americans, the mountains represent the terrifying sublime, but for the Chinese, they represent paradise, the geography of the enlightened. It is this geography that the garden evokes. This is a winter garden intended for use during the months when the emperor remained in the forbidden city. The complex is divided into four courtyards on a north-south axis, and I'll bring us now, oh good, it's working.
to this video, which shows where it is and will give you a feeling as you go through each of the courts of the intimate scale and yet the grandeur of the operation. So that gives you a, a feeling for what it looks like. The uh, dividing of that space into um, four courtyards ensures that a visitor does not experience the space as long and narrow, but rather as a sequence of near squares. Narrow gates, the complex is entered via a curved path through a slit between two rockeries, ensure a human scale. And for an emperor who always had attendants, for there to be so much of this in which the doors or the openings um, or the ways of entering into the grottos admitted only one person at a time was really very significant. To its 27 structures, the emperor gave names that signaled his hopes for the place. One enters through the gate of spreading auspiciousness and passes through, among others, the hall of fulfilling original wishes um, which is one of the tallest buildings in the Forbidden City, there it is, the building of extending delight, the belvedere of viewing achievements, and the supreme chamber of cultivating harmony. The emperor himself not only named such buildings, but also was the primary designer of the garden. The Lodge of Bamboo Fragrance, for example, is a building conceived as a book. Um, its ornament is entirely calligraphy, which as you can see is carved into wood and was then ornamented in blue azurite. Many of the original furnishings throughout the garden complex were made of root wood, a costly technique valued by emperors, but intended to show a disregard for human refinement and an ease with the Buddhist ideal of untroubled nature. The divide in China between court intrigue and the life of scholars is central to any study of the country's culture and had been recorded since the Warring States period around 600 uh, BC. It was much refined into an often deliberately awkward aesthetic for those outside the court during the Northern Song Dynasty, 960 to 1127 AD in our uh, calendar. Those scholar painters were often banished for their criticisms of the government some producing paintings and poems in miserable exile. It was widely accepted that their work was of greater consequence than the showy, decorative paintings produced at court. Indeed, paintings and calligraphy by many of the same scholars who had been ejected from the capital later entered the imperial collections and are now in Taiwan. Literati aesthetics define Chen Lung's garden project informed by his travels to inspect the southern territories of his realm. The rockeries, plantings, and waterways at the retirement garden, all constructed on a flat piece of land, evoke the mountain landscapes of southern China as uh, portrayed in Song and Ming painting. And there is um, uh, uh, Fan Quan, Travelers Amid Streams and Mountains, which is sort of um, viewed by many as the kind of the great uh, greatest manifestation of the Chinese literary, literati sensibility. The meandering nature of the classic scholar's garden had in the Ming period succumbed to the symmetries of northern taste. There is a Ming garden. You can see that it's much more stiff and formal. In the Qianlong garden, Suzhou's surprising vistas and winding paths have been brought into Manchu discipline, but some of that easy wandering has been re-engaged in a concise synthetic form, as I think you saw in that little fly-through video. The life envisioned for the Zhuang Qinjai was a solitary one, as befits the literary idea of contemplation. The elegant building bespeaks cultivated seclusion. Exhausted from diligent service, Chen Long wrote, I will cultivate myself, rejecting worldly noise. And this is what it looks like to reject worldly noise.
in some various private apartments. And you can see at the far end that there's this extraordinary theater that he built. More of that in a moment of the, of the theater. The richly, oh, there we go again. There it is. And there we go. The richly ornamented theater that occupies much of the interior, as you may have observed just now in the fly-through, has only one seat. But despite this literati, hmm, despite this literati conception, the construction of the Drunchen Jai reflects Chan Lung's ebullient profligacy. Even the building's framing timbers are polished hardwoods. The eastern five of the Drunchen Jai's nine bays contain the emperor's living quarters, ranged over two levels, and include sleeping and sitting platforms in 16 separate spaces. It gives you a feeling for how the whole thing is structured and how the uh, spaces are broken up. Um, this flank features an entire wall of zeton, the purple sandalwood beloved of emperors that was exceedingly rare at the time and is now nearly extinct. It's a sort of amount of it all in one place. It's almost unimaginable. Large jade cartouches are set into screens. Double-sided embroidery, that rare Sujo art, so this panel would have looked identical from both sides, was employed in the fabrication of 173 translucent interior windows. On the lower face of the wall are scenes of deer amid woods, all done in multiple techniques, layered one on top of another. Um, uh, the background consists of zeton marquetry, uh, 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 over which a foreground of carved inner bamboo skin, Ti Huang, is applied. The upper story shows scenes of peacocks, magpies, and phoenixes realized with the same methods and materials. Other parts of the screen are ornamented with bamboo thread marquetry by itself, a labor-intensive means of achieving a variegated pattern background for surface-mounted ornamentation. These techniques, usually employed for small decorative objects, here are translated onto vast surfaces, the only known instance of such architectural application. The lacquer work in the building is likewise of unique complexity and scale. Porcelain wall inserts show the sophistication of a precious vase. Wall panels are inlaid in azurite, jade, jasper, and other semi-precious stones. The handmade wallpaper, even the wallpaper, is impressed with mica and then printed in malachite. The interior features one of the largest cloisonne objects ever produced, a hanging pair of couplets in the emperor's own hand. Chen Lung was involved in the building of it every step of the way. The archives show a record of his requesting that a particular doorknob be replaced with cloisonne. And so indeed it was. Sadly, the only pictures of it are very blurry, but it's there, the cloisonné doorknob. Um, he was interested in every single detail. The John Trin Ji is notable for its embrace of foreign influences. Chan Lung imported enormous mirrors, which would have been an unspeakable conceit in 18th century China. While the cabinets are ornately uh, Chinese, their asymmetry shows Japanese influence. The exterior windows are glazed with European glass, and the use of glass in the throne has a kind of westery parallel to the distorted version of China evident in our chinoiserie. The four western bays of the Duan Qin Jai, which contain the theater with its stage and throne, boast lattice work that has been faux painted on hardwood to resemble the more ephemeral and less durable speckled bamboo. The walls and ceiling are covered in spectacular trompe l'oeil paintings that make use of the foreshortening and single point perspective that were developed in Renaissance Italy. And note that in this uh, painting, 
the bamboo is not an architectural element, it's part of the painting itself. They were heavily influenced by the work of Giuseppe Castiglione, we saw his portrait of Qianlong earlier, the Jesuit painter who lived in China from 1715 until his death in 1766, and was known by the Chinese as Long Xining. He was an important advisor to the emperor. It is possible that the murals even incorporate elements painted by Castiglione, though the John Shanjai project was undertaken after he died. The ceiling is particularly exquisite, with its depiction of a bamboo trellis groaning under the weight of a spectacular wisteria in full bloom, a joyful symbol of many generations of offspring, many, many generations of offspring. The wall murals represent a garden extending the aesthetic just outside to the interior. Here, painted peonies would have continued to bloom, skies to remain summer blue through the long, cold Beijing winter. The murals were painted on silk, using Chinese pigment in a Western style applied in keeping with a Chinese aesthetic. The Chinese influence on Western art during this period has been much pondered, but this entangled reciprocity, though less frequent and perhaps less profound, is also worthy of notice. Like Marie Antoinette, playing at being a shepherdess, Chan Long liked the fantasy of being a hermit in the mountain rather than an emperor in the forbidden city. And the Zhuang Jinjai was clearly a reflection of the ambivalent nature of such fantasies. He wanted to set the stage so he could be a solitary monk. It's such a romantic notion. But he never took much interest in actually doing it. He saw no discontinuity between being the richest man in the world and leading an ascetic life in the mountains. He claimed to want to be known as the man with nothing to do. It's a title many of us, I think, might aspire to. But he never pursued such leisure. It is a sign of imperial decadence at every level to pour such enormous resources into something you don't actually do, to keep choice awake for the sake of choice itself and not because you want to make those choices or enter this reality. The private expense of this undertaking makes it seem in some ways almost like something he built to impress himself. The pleasure of the Garden of Contemplation was its construction, not its inhabitants. And yet, and yet the garden has content that suggests a deep commitment to Buddhist precepts. Confucian thought suggests that in order to rule, an emperor has to be an enlightened being. And the garden complex expresses the aspiration to enlightenment, a place where he could seek the humbleness of his human consciousness apart from his status as emperor. He appears to have felt that his Buddhist goals were in some sense at least his ultimate ones. The Manchu Qing subscribed to Tibetan Buddhism rather than the Chan Buddhism that had been more popular in China. The Manchus were allies with the Mongolians in the 17th century and the fifth Dalai Lama said in the mid 1600s that the Manchu rulers had inherited a living Buddha status. Tibetan Buddhism is more orthodox um, than Chan Buddhism, as far away from it as Catholicism is from Protestantism. It is focused perhaps most significantly on compassion toward others rather than on an inward journey to find enlightenment within the self. And I think that's a set of values that is reflected in many of the governing decisions that Chan Long meant, uh, that Chan Long brought about. Chan Long had been brought up, in fact, alongside a living Buddha, a Mongolian who came to live in the court and was educated together with Chan Long. He became the Chan Long Emperor's Buddhist mentor, teacher, and guide. Chan Long, identified as a descendant of the Bodhisattva Manjushri, made extended visits throughout his life to the holy sites at Mount Wutai, where a lock of Madhushri's hair was said to reside. His grandfather, uh, Kangxi, also made pilgrimages there. Chan Lung may have escalated into decadence in his later years, but he also aspired to mental cultivation, and the garden is full of spots for meditation and contemplation. There's just one of them. As you walk through it, you get a real feeling of a place where you could sit and think 
and where the changing effects of light and the changing relationship between um, uh, the rocks and the trees and the buildings would constantly inspire you to rethink the structures um, uh, of human enterprise. The vision behind it, though expensive, is extremely spiritual. Chan Lung meditated daily. He built many temples. He had many Buddhist images created. The very notion of opulent Buddhism may sound oxymoronic to some Western ears, but it is the guiding principle here. And the Tibetan aesthetic, there it is more um, uh, opulent Buddhism. Uh, and the Tibetan aesthetic um, is very much in evidence in the garden. Um, this is from one of the uh, garden buildings. You can see, I think, the very strong um, Tibetan focus, that this looks um, uh, much uh, more Western um, than a lot of Chinese Buddhist imagery that would have come before. Westerners have often perceived the decoration of the buildings and the structure of the garden as separate things, the natural and the man-made, the inner self of thought separated from the outer self of action. But these Cartesian dualities do not parse in Chan Lung's sensibility. The interiors of the Zhuanqin Jai are all made with views of what lies outside them, and there you can see that there are windows. You can't really see that there are views, but I, I promise you there are. Um, and there is no such thing as house and garden, only a single complex. Man, being made by nature, makes only a further show of nature. It's never been easy to form a human portrait of a Chinese emperor. The godlike aspect of these men enters the public record and the personal is usually so well hidden from view that it can be difficult to know whether it existed. The Chan Lung Garden helps. In it, one gains a much more human sense of the emperor, and there he is in his garden. It's rather difficult to see, but he's um, seated in some splendor in the forward court, um, wearing yellow, sort of just above that little run of steps. I don't seem to have a pointer, but anyway, he's just over there. Um, hi. Um, uh, in the garden, one gains a much more human sense of the emperor and begins to sense that he was a person and not just the supreme instrument of an absolute power structure. He had his own interests, his own personality, his own desires, spiritual or otherwise, and Chan Lung was in many ways a romantic. His first wife died at 40 when he was still quite young. He wrote her poems in the form of letters for the whole rest of his life and he was noted among all Chinese for the incredibly close attention that he paid to his mother in her waning years. There's a lot about him that's really very touching. Chan Lung delivered a sort of early preservation edict, declaring that the complex was not to be altered, that it would be a permanent spot for retiring emperors. Over 600 years that the Forbidden City has existed, the prince's residence and concubine's quarters and even many of the public halls were all rebuilt numerous times, but not the uh, Chen Lung Garden Complex. This is the only spot that has the complete vision of one emperor. It was used only occasionally in the years after his death. A dowager empress lived there for a little while, and some members of the court had birthday parties there. Pu Yi, the last emperor, added a painting to the complex, and there he is, poor fellow, um, standing um, just in front of the Drunchen Jai. Received opinion in the West has often suggested that Chinese aesthetics reached an apex in the late Song and early Ming dynasties, declined through the early Qing, and then reached a nadir post Qianlong. In looking at the restoration of the Drunchen Jai, the quality of the craftsmanship sometimes exceeds the quality of the taste, where opulence often upstages subtlety. To Western eyes, this complex may reflect an era subsequent to the heyday of Chinese discernment. Many Western connoisseurs prefer Chinese monochrome and minimalism, and some feel that even work from the reign of the Yongzheng Emperor, Chen Long's father, is more refined than this. But Chen Long represents the full efflorescence of Qing taste, its ultimate manifestation, and many contemporary Chinese revel in the riotous pattern and gold and enamel, preferring such exuberance to austere discipline. 
If Qianlong were alive today, one scholar said, he would be wearing Versace. It is worth noting that different times entail different points of view. In an era when WMF is preserving Victorian architecture around the world and modernist offices that would once have been written off as second rate, we need to recognize that this decadent Qing ought not to be dismissed, lest we value it only too late when it is past saving. When I was in Beijing in 1988, I went to see the Garden of the Palace of Established Happiness in the Forbidden City. Um, that was just uh, 1998. That was just when um, the, uh, uh, the Zhuan Jinjai had first been unlocked. Um, this garden was built in 1740, um, and it was being rebuilt um, largely under the aegis of um, a delightful woman named, um, wonderfully, Happy Haroon. Um, and there is Happy Haroon. Um, the garden had burned down in 1923, and Happy Haroon was in charge of reconstructing it. Um, the only thing that had survived that fire were the plinths of the buildings. One of the workers who was there told me about how the Minister of Culture had come to pay a visit and see the progress that was being made. And he said, well, all of the wooden structures you're building look wonderful, he said, but the stone is in terrible condition and it should be replaced. The worker explained that the stone was actually part of the original building and um, that it was therefore being conserved. And the Minister of Culture said, would you wear an old, would you wear a new suit with old shoes? So I think that attitude meant that the WMF had its work cut out for it um, on beginning work in the Forbidding City. Um, shifting the sensibility of restoration to one of conservation. The Zhan Chun Jai had been neglected in part because it represented Qing decadence, in part because it was too small to allow for the mass tourism that the rest of the Forbidden City sustained, and in part because the techniques used in it were so refined as to be beyond the skill of living craftsmen. Many employed materials long gone from the world, extinct species of trees, or a stiffened lacquered gauze for which the technique is lost, though the same technique was used in Han Dynasty shoes and Song Dynasty hats. We can reproduce its appearance, but not the thing itself. WMF introduced the protocols through which scientific technique and microscopy could be used to determine most of the original processes used to achieve an effect or finish. This allowed for those processes, often involving many layers of ornament, to be reproduced with precision. The conservation of the Zhuan Jinjai, on which WMF is collaborating with the Palace Museum, has had to blend Eastern and Western concepts, aesthetics, techniques, and materials, as the original building and grounds did. Conservators, similarly, have had to reconcile ancient craft and modern science. There were substantial challenges in conserving a building constructed by artisans who are masters of long-lost techniques. The crafts, the crafts themselves had to be reinvented and relearned, then squared with modern technologies. And there you see people beginning work on the, um, well, actually quite far along on the work of the restoration of the ceiling of the theater and some of the other uh, areas. Um, these were huge processes, and WMF actually had to build a studio in the Forbidden City in which that work could be done. Um, uh, science and art were tied singularly tightly together. It took science to understand the lost techniques and science to recreate them, though the execution was a matter of extraordinary art. In upscaling, um, there you have um, extraordinary art. In upscaling miniature techniques, Chan Long had reinvented the structures that supported them. Conservators accustomed to small objects had to figure out how to expand intricate work processes on large architectural surfaces, which of necessity have different sublayers. At the start, no one knew exactly how these elements had been constructed. You can see someone there who has taken it apart and is putting it all back together. 
The governors of southern provinces were contacted in a quest to locate skilled artisans who came from Anhui north of Shanghai and Zhejiang to its south. The conservators working on the project felt that the paper used in the restoration should be of Chinese manufacture. So an expert papermaker from England came to train Chinese workers in a technique originally invented in China. All of the work had to be done within the walls of the Forbidden City to avoid the risk of sending out an original and getting back a masterful copy. The foreign part of the team included conservators from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Getty Conservation Institute, the Peabody Essex Museum, where many of you may recall there was an exhibition of some of the contents um, of the Drun Jin Jai uh, that was mounted while the work was going on, uh, Winter Tour Museum, the University of Minnesota, uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Museum of Modern Art, and others who both taught and learned from their Chinese collaborators. Partly on the basis of experience uh, its faculty gained on this project, Tsinghua University's Cultural Heritage Conservation Center now offers a postgraduate degree in architectural conservation for wood structures and historic interiors and furniture. This is the first advanced degree in conservation of historic Chinese interiors and wood furniture. Fifteen years ago, when the collaboration began, China was just entering the world of conservation. Now, in the accelerated Chinese way, it has experts of world quality. Such expertise will not be wasted. Work has begun to restore the other buildings of the retirement garden so that the entire complex once more can be seen much as Qianlong designed it. The restoration of the Duan Qinjai has been a collaboration that goes far beyond that one building. You saw some of the before pictures. Look how it looks now. Um, it is at the center of a mutually beneficial international exchange of views and techniques for conservation. Those are the translucent windows with the two-sided embroidery. It has involved more in terms of training, outreach, and publications than any other collaboration with which WMF has been involved. And there you see the theater in all its glory, ready for the performance. The garden and its structures built so an emperor could play at being a hermit philosopher, does not show how he lived, given that he never lived there. But it shows how he thought. It is how he wanted paradise to look. In an, it is an essay about the end of life, a musing on what it means to grow old. In its immoderate poetry, luxurious appointments, and Baroque austerity, it expresses the ambiguities of power and detachment. Marie Antoinette was given to simulating ingenuousness with her shepherdess's croc in her hammo at Versailles at about the same time that the Qianlong Emperor was building the retirement garden. But what seems like affectation in her points to a genuine idealism in him. On this cloisonné plaque, that hung in the Duan Qinjai are the emperor's words, purity and order in the mind on tens of thousands of issues are to be held in one heart. An emperor's life entails the chaos of an unruly realm. The retirement garden was to be the place where so complicated a life could be made lucid and yet remain undiminished. Thank you. Thank you very much. that wonderful address, Andrew. And all of you uh, look forward to reading a lot of it again.
in the World Monuments Fund 50th anniversary book when it's published next fall. And we look forward to seeing you at uh, more of the lectures of this series and hopefully also at the Hadrian Gala. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you.